Communities that is organized by the Center for Aggressive Scaling by Advanced Processes or ASAP. This is a IUCRC, a Industry University Cooperative Research Center that is supported by National Science Foundation. Um, and this webinar series is uh, an effort. I hear, I hear beep. Okay. Um, sorry. So this webinar series is um, uh, an effort on our part to get uh, industry collaborators on board. Uh, and so our purpose of this series is to highlight some of the ongoing research projects in the center, solicit feedback on those projects, as well as ideas for some additional topics that uh, potential sponsors would like us to work on. Um, and so this is really going to be a lot of discussion uh, at the end of the uh, webinar. Uh, we'll start off uh, with presentations by uh, three team members, three teams, I should say, uh, and uh, then we'll conclude by having a Q&A and a discussion session. Uh, I'll describe those, uh, the sort of the rules of this uh, uh, webinar uh, in a minute, but let me go to the next slide here uh, and highlight the topic of today's webinar. It is, uh, the center has three themes. Uh, the first two themes, uh, theme one is electrical and photonic interconnects. Uh, this uh, theme already had a webinar a few weeks back. Uh, heterogeneous integration theme, 3D integration also had its webinar series. The last one, theme three, uh, is going to be presenting today. And there are three presentations I talked about. Um, the first one, uh, delivered by our faculty members, Namsung Kim and Sogata Ghosh. Uh, Namsung is a faculty in the EC department. Uh, Sogata is a faculty in CS. And their collaborative effort uh, is, uh, will be shared with you. Uh, topic being scalable, resistive, memory-based processing using memory. Uh, the second talk is more on the device side of the spectrum uh, by professors Wen Juan Zhu and Ching Kao. Uh, and they will talk about their work on using ferroelectric devices. These are uh, devices that are emerging and how can these devices be used for implementing computing systems? That's topic two. Um, and the last one, last topic is uh, by Ching and Sogata on cross-stack cross -stack design of non-Von Neumann computers. So three talks, each talk is going to be, I want to say exactly 15 minutes so that we all have time to uh, engage in a QA and a with our audience. Um, so please uh, request to the speakers to you know, make sure you uh, wind up in 15 minutes. Um, the audience can post their questions in Q&A, but uh, we won't answer it until the end. And those answers will be provided by the speakers, uh, potentially by other um, attendees, uh, but verbally. So we'll be providing those uh, responses verbally towards the end. Uh, so the speakers should wait uh, until they respond to the chat questions. And this webinar, as you can tell, is being recorded and it will be posted on the ASAP website. So you can uh, certainly take a look. If you have to leave early, uh, you can come back and uh, look at the recording. Uh, and again, this is all an effort on our part to um, prep, uh, preparation for our in-person industry NSF workshop. Uh, this is a workshop to be held on April 21st and 22nd at uh, on our campus here at UIUC. Uh, at that meeting, uh, we will have additional uh, project presentations, accounting for your feedback that you've provided during this webinar series. And uh, hopefully we want to get as many industry sponsors involved uh, in our center from day one and help uh, articulate uh, and sharpen our vision of the center uh, so that uh, we can, you know, find uh, grounds for mutual collaboration. Uh, there is the, yeah, there's a website here and this uh, slides will be posted on the ASAP website so you can take a look later. 
So with that, uh, without any further delay, let's get started with the first presentation. Uh, this is by Namsung Kim and Sokata Ghosh. Uh, so I'm going to stop screen share and invite Namsung and Sogata to begin their presentation. Thanks, Nash. Uh, can everybody see my slides? Yes. All right, perfect. So thank you very much. Um, and uh, yeah, uh, today Namsung and I, we're gonna talk a little bit about some of our ideas on looking at how we can design architectures and systems that allow us to do truly scalable processing using memory. And in particular, you know, I want to start by giving you some groundwork on our prior work. Uh, we've actually done a, a, a number of uh, projects working in collaboration with device uh, and circuit technologists. And one of the things that's come out of that is this architecture that we're basing some of this work on called Racer. <clears throat> and I'll talk a little bit about you know, what that device level insight has been and what it's led us to. Uh, and you know, Racer has given us a good starting point for what I'd argue is fairly efficient computation for a number of sort of diverse kernels. And what we'd like to do is use that as our springboard for a lot of the scaling uh, projects that we're looking at uh, for the ASAP Center. And so briefly, I'm gonna start just by giving you a little bit of background on Racer and what it does. And just to note, I'm gonna talk about this in the context of RERAM just to make things easy for all of us, but uh, We've consciously designed Racer to be uh, relatively technology and device agnostic so that it can apply to a whole range of emerging memory technologies and hopefully in the near future, things like SRAM and DRAM as well. Uh, but the, you know, it, in our reram world, we're taking advantage of this property that we see that when you turn on two cells at once, you can actually get this Boolean function that happens uh, predictably. Uh, in the case of reram crossbars, we can actually turn on two cells and be able to save the NOR of those two cells into a third cell. And various uh, proposals have come up for these types of Boolean logic uh, technologies over the years. And people have used those to essentially perform bit serial operations within memory arrays. And while this sounds like it's very promising, you know, we do have the challenges of bit serial operations, which are that you know, the latencies of these individual, uh, the, the tasks that we try to do end up accumulating very quickly because we're now doing a whole bunch of back-to-back -back operations. And so the solution that people have naturally come up with is, okay, that's great, let's go to parallelism. We'll make our arrays gigantic. And of course that will amortize this latency by just giving more throughput in the end. The problem that we found in working with, you know, across the stack was that, uh, as you add more devices to the size of your column or tier row that you're doing computation on, um, you know, we actually start adding so much current uh, for every additional cell that we come up against the current carrying capacities of the wires that make up these arrays. And so practically speaking, while we would love to have really large arrays, it's actually difficult to do whole column operations on arrays that are larger than 200 by 200. And of course, when you hear that, the natural conclusion is, well, that sounds awful. I can't amortize my peripheral circuitry. Uh, it's difficult for me to have all these arrays and have them coordinated. Uh, I'm losing a lot of scalability advantages. And so what we did was to essentially co-design uh, circuits, uh, taking advantage of the devices to build up you know, circuits and architectures that contributed to Racer uh, to allow us to efficiently use small arrays. And so, no, I'm not going to go into too much in the interest of time, uh, but we essentially find a way to do this very fine grain pipelining that allows us to make up for a lot of this performance. Um, essentially, we have tiles that we treat almost the same as pipeline stages. And the trick here is that each tile holds one bit of one word. So multiple tiles are, are needed to make up a single word of data. Uh, and then we introduce these buffers that are also made out of RERAM or whatever the memory technology that we're using is that allow us to communicate from tile to tile without having to do any domain transformations. And in doing this, what this allows us to do is pipeline over multiple sets of, of words such that while I'm working on, let's say bit one of one set of words, I can in parallel work on bit zero of another set of words and exploit not only parallelism, 
but a lot of reuse opportunities that we have. Um, we've built this into a fairly scalable architecture so far. And so I can take these small 64 by 64 tiles and assemble them into a cluster, um, which essentially gives us a unit of, of multiple tiles that we can amortize the peripheral circuitry over. So for 4,000 of those 64 by 64 tiles, we can actually multiplex a single set of peripheral circuits and control circuits. Uh, in fact, we use uh, back-end line integration to help uh, overlap the arrays themselves with the actual logic to really amortize the footprint that we have here. And what we can do with that is then we can stamp out however many or however few clusters that we want into what we believe is a fairly practical to fabricate architecture. And so you can have a chip that either has a single cluster and has two megabytes of memory, or we can scale all the way up to eight gigabytes to fitting within a four millimeter squared footprint while making sure that we've you know, obeyed all of the thermal dissipation limits that we and power delivery limits that we have. Um, one of the things that I'm always a big proponent of, as you'll see, is that programmability is also important. And so while I'm not going to talk about it uh, due to time, uh, we essentially have a vector core abstraction that we've provided that allows us to use this in a fairly intuitive way. Uh, but I'm going to cut to the results uh, in the sake of time. What we find is that with Racer, we can actually you know, perform 107, get 107x performance that we get out of the CPU because of the pipelining that we unlocked. Um, and that's over a 16 core state-of-the-art Xeon CPU. And we can get a 12x uh, speed up over an RTX 2070 GPU. And those numbers are actually a little bit lower. We've done some revisions to our Mac operation and we can actually bring that up. I believe the CPU speed up is now 187x. And at the same time, we're seeing energy and uh, savings that are of the same orders of magnitude, 189x versus the CPU and 17x versus the GPU. And so while uh, you can imagine with a lot of the software overheads and things like that, things will come down, there's still a lot of room to play with here that we're working with. But there are a number of scalability limitations that we still have with Racer. And the work that Namsung and I are proposing here is really aimed at trying to overcome uh, those types of limitations. The first thing that we're looking at is this idea of the multi-level cells. Right now in Racer, we assume that one cell holds one bit of data. We're doing things in the digital domain, and we do that to avoid the nonlinear IV curves that many of these resistive devices have. But the downside is that it kills our density. And so what we want to look at is how we can support things like a multi-level cell uh, inside the Racer architecture. Now we have some work that's under submission that's already looked at how we can expand you know, uh, the decode and driver circuitry inside Racer, the only components of the architecture that are actually device specific to incorporate many, many different types of devices. And we believe that by expanding this cir these circuits slightly, um, we can actually use, we use much of them to be able to enable this MLC-like behavior. Uh, one of the big open questions we still have is how we can efficiently merge multiple bits and write them to a cell. And that's really one of the big open questions we'd like to answer as part of our work uh, for ASAP here. But we hope that in doing that, we can actually be able to scale up much in the way that uh, NAND flash has, but also enable uh, PIM processing at the same time. Uh, with that, I'll hand it over to Nam Song to talk about some of the other projects we've got in mind. Hi. So in this slide, I'm trying to uh, come up with an idea that can make this race uh, more general purpose and uh, more efficient. And you know that I mean, it's hard to implement the complex operations within this uh, processing and memory type architectures because of the area constraint and so on. So one of the interesting way that we can support more complex operations and also in terms of making this more efficient, I think it's critical to reduce the number of operations. Now let's say we can support or we can tolerate some approximation here, then combining the MLC feature that Sagata said, we can apply so-called neural transformation of the, some code region. So this code region will have many, many operations, but with the neural transformation, we transform all these different types of complex operation into multiply and add, which can be done pretty well with the race architecture. So in this proposal, we want to explore how we can efficiently integrate this neural acceleration unit along with the, some kind of a compiler support 
for neural transformation. And uh, you know that, I mean, there will be trade-off in terms of uh, capacity through MLC and the reliability of the cell values. So I think this is a perfect fit with uh, our uh, future direction, leveraging the unique properties of uh, supporting the MLC operations. Next. And another aspect that I want to work on in this project is that, you know, at the end, this racer has to be used with uh, uh, traditional CPUs because racer has a limited uh, number of operations and they cannot run operating system very well, for example. So eventually we have to make this racer work with the uh, CPU for end-to-end -end executionable common applications. And there are several problems stemming from sharing the memory between CPU and the racer. So one of the problems is that the data will be interleaved across multiple racer chips. And if you look at the conventional DRAM chip, each chip will have only 4-bit or 8-bit I.O. And in some cases, we will not have an entire world stored inside a single racer chip. So in this case, we can leverage a buffer chip on the memory module. Actually, the, the purpose of buffer chip is to support the bigger capacity having multiple ranks in a DIMM. But not just the amplifying app, uh, capability, but we can add some control logic and the computing capability within this uh, buffer chip shown in the, on the right side. The FPGA is the current uh, prototype that I have, but this can be applied to this kind of architecture and uh, we will look into how we can uh, do computation more efficiently while the data is interleaved across the race, uh, leveraging this smart memory buffer chip. Next. And finally, another challenge associated with the processing in memory or processing using memory. From the CPU end, I mean, to communicate with the racer chip, I mean, we will have to have some kind of a programming API and so on. And uh, from the software world, they don't want to change their application code. So I'm approaching this from the system side and how we can make all these applications transparent to, uh, how, how, how can we make this architecture transparent to the application side? So again, leveraging this smart memory buffer chip and we can add some kind of a two-sided RDMA capability here. I mean, there are a lot of programming or source code based on RDB, RDMA programming model. So we support this RDMA capability with some conventional CPU integrated with it within this buffer chip. We, I think we can make the application transparent to this specific architecture. So that's it from my end and the next. All right, thanks Namsung. <clears throat> um, so yeah, just you know, to quickly summarize, you know, we're hoping that Racer is kind of this nice starting point for, for us to be able to conduct a lot of these scalability arguments. It, it's certainly not to say that Racer is the end-all be-all for, for processing and memory architectures, but we believe it has some nice properties that we can build off of and that can give us some lessons that we can try to extrapolate to palm architectures in general. And so our hope is that with these different things that we've talked about, that we can actually give us a much more flexible uh, and scalable solution to doing a lot of this processing using memory cells. So with that, uh, thanks a lot for uh, listening to us and uh, I'll turn it back over to Naresh. Right, thank you Naum. And so Gata, that was a very nice overview. A lot of questions uh, in my mind, a lot of uh, interesting topics to explore. Maybe we'll have some discussion toward the end. Uh, at this point, I would like to shift gears and invite our second uh, speakers for the second talk, Professor Wen Juan Zhu from um, the EC department and Professor Ching Kao from the material science department. So let me um, invite them, Wen Juan and Ching, to begin their talk. Thank you uh, for the introduction. And uh, thank you for uh, coming to this webinar. So today uh, we'll discuss energy efficient computing based on ferroelectric device. Uh, this work is a joint uh, collaboration research uh, between uh, Qing Kao's group and Xia Lu's group and my group. All right, uh, this is the research overview of this project. 
So in this project, we are going to develop a ferroelectric reconfigurable logic and an analog device with embedded memories and develop a ferroelectric interconnect with a tunable weight. And using this uh, reconfigurable and a tunable device to integrate them together into a 3D uh, system and use that to implement uh, new computing systems and architectures. So aiming to achieve highly parallel, high speed computing uh, with uh, high energy efficiency. So this uh, new type of uh, ferroelectric device and systems potentially have uh, many uh, applications uh, including uh, data intensive computing, artificial intelligence, and signal processing. So this is a, a background and the motivation of this project. In the uh, traditional computing system, the memory and the logic are sitting on the opposite of the uh, bus. So for the every operations, the data need to be moved back and forth between memory and the logic. So this will induce a large amount of delays and energy consumption due to this uh, data transportation. In recent years, there are many uh, new uh, computing system and architecture has been explored. Uh, for example, data stream processor, in-memory computing, analog computing, and neuromorphic computing. This uh, new computing si uh, uh, architectures and systems can be implemented uh, using ferroelectric device. So this is uh, our uh, main uh, target on this project. So first, uh, let's take a look at the data stream processor. In data stream processor, the logic unit are reconfigured according to the data flow. So the large data set will pass from one logic unit to the next logic unit without intermediate stop at the memory uh, unit. So this will eliminate the frequent uh, transportation for the data between the logic and the memory. So by removing these uh, intermediate steps to the memory unit, we can uh, save a lot of energy and time uh, for the computation. So traditionally, this uh, logic uh, unit is implemented by FPGAs. So FPGA stands for the Field Programmable Gate Arrays. So the, there is two uh, limitations of P P FPGAs. One is the low circuit density, the other is the high energy consumption due to this large amount of switch box and interconnect. So to address this problem, we propose to use a ferroelectric reconfigurable logic device. So unlike the traditional silicon transistors, uh, where the polarity of the transistor is determined by the doping uh, type in the soft stream region, so N plus will give an uh, N-tap uh, transistor and a P plus doping in the soft stream will give a P-tap transistor. So in the, the traditional silicon CMOS transistor, the polarity is fixed after fabrication. So that's the uh, reason that in the FPGAs, the uh, fu function, uh, the reconfigurable function is achieved by switch box instead of by the transistor itself. If we can make a ferroelectric reconfigurable logic device, then the polarity of each individual transistor can be switched by the local polarization in the ferroelectric layer. Then each individual transistor can change the function itself that will make uh, this uh, reconfigurable logic have a higher uh, flexibility. So this is a schematic of ferroelectric reconfigurable logic device. So underneath the semiconductor channel, we can embed it a layer of ferroelectrics. So the, the polarization in the ferroelectric can induce electrons or holes in the local region, which is equivalent to N-type doping or P-type doping in the soft stream. So by switching the polarization in the ferroelectric layer, we can change the transistor from N-type to P-type. So without changing the layout or the interconnect. So this device level reconfigurability will be able to enable the circuit to transform their function in real time. This is uh, the preliminary result. So in this device, we have ferroelectric CIPS uh, stacked on top of the 2D semiconductor channel, molybdenum telluride. So by applying a pulse on the program gate, we can change the polarization direction in the CIPS that will induce the local doping, either N-type doping or P-type doping in the soft stream region. 
So the center shows the energy diagram of this transistor and the red figure shows the transfer characteristics. So if the source string region are both programmed into n-type by the CIPS, then the transistor will behave like an n-fat. And if both source string are in, um, programmed into a p-type, then the transistor behave as a unipolar p-back transistor. So this transfer curve was measured after we removed the program pulse. That means this uh, configuration is non-volatile. So this result uh, shows that indeed we can change the polarity of the transistor by flipping the polarization in the ferroelectric layer. So this means uh, this uh, transistor have this non-volatile uh, reconfigurability. Using these uh, ferroelectric transistors, we can make a variety of different reconfigurable logic circuit. So this is one example. If we change the polarity of the T1, T2 transistor from P-type to N-type and change the T3, T4 transistor from N-type to P-type, then this circuit will change the functionality from a NAND gate to a NOR gate. There are many other logic uh, circuit we can uh, um, make. For example, the XOR, XNOR, adder subtractors, all these logic units will be able to change their functionalities in real time by flipping the local polarizations in the individual transistor without changing the layout or interconnect between the transistors. So using this uh, reconfigurable logic circuit, then we can make this uh, data stream processors. So by uh, uh, assemble this logic uh, circuit according to the data flow and configure each unit according to the function that we need to perform on that particular data, then we can make this uh, a pipeline of logic of blocks and the data can be processed into from one logic block to the other logic block without the intermediate stop at the memory uh, unit. So this uh, data stream processor will enable this highly parallel computing and uh, uh, with low energy consumption. So as compared to the traditional data stream processor using FPGAs, this uh, very electric uh, data stream processor will have the advantage of high packing density and uh, low energy consumption. But in addition to this, we can also use the reconfigurable logic device for uh, security hardware. So since each transistor's the functionality is not determined by the loop, it's determined by the local polarizations. So the reverse engineer uh, techniques cannot uh, detect what is the real function of each transistor. So that means the functionality of the circuit can be camouflaged. Uh, in addition, the transistor function or the circuit function can be controlled by a key. This key will determine the polarizations uh, on each transistor. So this means this, this type of circuit or systems can have this uh, logic locking uh, security uh, functions. So now uh, let's uh, switch gear to the second type of the systems based on ferroelectric uh, device, uh, the neuromorphic computing uh, based on ferroelectric uh, synapses. So compared to the traditional computing, uh, uh, the neuromorphic computing potentially can have a uh, higher energy efficiency and also can be uh, have the deep learning capabilities. So here shows uh, one example, the supercomputer with uh, 1.2 billion transistors consume more than 100,000 watts, but a brain with 100 million neurons only uh, consume 20 watts. So that motivates people to pursue neuromorphic computing uh, um, for higher energy efficiency uh, and higher speed. So for the, uh, in the neuromorphic computing, one important element is the synapses. Traditionally, there are many different uh, type of device I explored for these applications, including phase change memory, resistive changing memory, conductive bridge memories. Among these uh, candidates, ferroelectric memory is one of the uh, most promising uh, candidates. Uh, ferroelectric uh, synapses uh, based on ferroelectric tunnel junctions potentially can have the advantage of high speed, low energy consumption, and high endurance. So in this work, uh, we explored the ferroelectric tunnel junction uh, based on ferroelectric doped hafnium oxide. 
So in our group, we developed a ferroelectric uh, doped hafen oxide using a variety of different uh, doping elements, uh, such as zirconium and aluminum. So here shows uh, some example uh, result. So for zirconium doped hafen oxide, the remnant polarization can exceed 20 microcoulomb per centimeter square, and the uh, retention and endurance also uh, shows an uh, excellent uh, result. So the middle figure shows the retention of the aluminum doped half oxide. The projected retention can extend uh, 10 years. The endurance of uh, this doped half oxide uh, can be over one to the uh, 10 to the eight uh, cycles. Okay. Uh, in addition to that, for neuromorphic computing, uh, one important properties is the resistance of the junction needs to be continuously tunable. So that means we need uh, many levels of intermediate state. So the red figure shows the polarization as a function of the program pulse width and a variety of different uh, program voltage. We can see that this polarization is indeed can be gradually tuned by changing the, the pulse width or pulse amplitude. Uh, this uh, tunable polarization is important uh, for neuromorphic computing applications. So another uh, important feature that uh, required for uh, neuromorphic synapses is this uh, tunable uh, conductance. So the left figure shows the tunneling conductance for FTGs as a function of the number of the poles uh, after we programmed with the potentiation poles and the depression poles. We can see that this conductance can be gradually changed when we apply a potentiation pulse or depression pulse. And this, uh, this two uh, side, the, the gradually increase of conductance and the decrease of conductance shows a good linearity and a good symmetry uh, between these two operations. The, um, for neuromorphic uh, computing, uh, uh, important, uh, another important feature that's required is uh, spike timing dependence uh, plasticity. That means if you apply a pulse in the pre-neuron and uh, give a feedback pulse of the post-neuron, the, the conductance of the FTGs or the synapses need to be updated according to this uh, to fit the input and the feedback so that it can remember what is learned last time and can learn for the new task. So the red figure shows the conductance change of these FTGs after we apply a pair of pulse uh, to mimic the pre-neuron spike and the post-neuron spike. So it depends on the timing difference between these two pulse, this uh, FTG will have different response. A positive feedback will increase the conductance and a negative feedback will reduce the conductance. And depends on the the timing between the input and the feedback, the shorter the timing between them, the largest uh, response, the, the largest change on the conductance. And if the feedback were given after a long delay, then the conductance are nearly unchanged. So this behavior uh, is exactly mimic the function of the biological synapses. So that uh, shows a promising result for neuromorphic computing. So the, the third type of the uh, device we're going to discuss is uh, the analog and the in-memory computing based on ferroelectric uh, devices. So analog computing and in-memory computing has uh, emerged in recent years. So compared to the digi digital computing, analog computing can have a potential uh, advantage such as uh, faster uh, and more energy efficient or more compact. Uh, although it has the disadvantage of less accurate and uh, more vulnerable to the noise. Okay. So this is a short one example. If we use the, the traditional digital circuit to calculate the addition of two 8-bit uh, numbers, we need uh, about 50 transistors. However, if we do the analog computing, we can just use two wires to implement uh, this addition function. For multiplication function, in yeah, analog computing, we can just use one transistor. However, if we do the digital computing, that needs uh, almost 1,000 transistors. So this is uh, uh, one example as why uh, analog computing can have advantage uh, in uh, some specific task. 
another I, do, uh, I just want to remind you we are uh, running out of time so okay all right okay so here we propose you the ferroelectric uh, graphene uh, transistors to do the analog and in-memory computing so in traditional silicon transistors um, the 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 unipolar behavior was determined that the transistor is suitable to calculate a minus b a function. However, for absolute function, it's very difficult to implement. For graphene, however, due to this uh, zero band gap and ambipolar uh, transport, we can easily calculate the a minus b absolute value. So this is this function is very useful for the uh, image processing and. Uh, um, uh, a signal processing process. For example, if we use uh, silicon transistors uh, to compare uh, one uh, pair of image uh, per pixel, we'll need uh, 23 transistors. But if we use a graphene transistor, it only need uh, one transistor to uh, implement this function. So this is the result uh, we uh, get for a graphene transistor with embedded ferroelectric memory. We can change the direct point for each graphene transistor that's equivalent to change the reference or the target value for each pixel. And we can use that to calculate uh, the difference between two images or the, the difference uh, between two patterns. So using the graphene uh, arrays, we uh, explored the, the, a variety of different analog uh, in-memory computing applications, such as uh, image comparison, pattern recognition, and motion detection. So we can see that this uh, graphene uh, array indeed can serve as a, a sensitive uh, detector and uh, an area efficient uh, detectors to compare our uh, two images. So this uh, ferroelectric uh, analog uh, devices, uh, reconfigurable logic device and uh, synapses can be uh, integrated uh, in a 3D monolithic fashion on silicon CMOS to form uh, this uh, uh, this uh, 3D hybrid stacks. So in this uh, 3D hybrid stacks, we can uh, explore a variety of different uh, computing uh, architectures and systems. For example, data dream processor, uh, in-memory computing, and uh, neuromorphic computing. So in, in this uh, system, the semiconductor can be uh, either uh, 2D materials or silicon nanomembranes. So here, um, uh, Ching uh, Chao going to discuss a little bit on the silicon nanomembranes. Um, yeah, I just uh, want to add, like in addition to 2D materials, we can actually do it based on conventional single crystalline silicon. So we developed a process that allow us to transfer this single crystalline silicon on wafer scale from one SOI substrate to another substrate, pretty much at room temperature. Uh, the thickness of the transfer printed single crystal in silicon uh, can have a thickness below 10 nanometers, so we can incorporate them directly as the channel in junction with logic transistors. They demonstrate performance comparable to what you can you can get based on just a single crystal in silicon wafer directly. We also developed a custom base custom build transfer printing machine. So we can do this transfer printing process over large area with high throughput. Okay, thank you. So uh, with this uh, uh, 2D membranes and 2D materials, we'll be able to make this uh, ferroelectric uh, analog logic uh, and interconnect devices. Uh, so this research will enable a variety of different uh, energy efficient ferroelectric device and the 3D monolithic integrations can bring a variety of device in a close proximity uh, so that we can reduce the energy consumption uh, due to the data transportations. So those uh, uh, ferroelectric device and circuit will enable uh, this uh, in-memory computing um, and uh, highly parallel uh, data stream processors. Um, so that's all uh, for uh, this uh, presentation. So here we will uh, like to acknowledge the student and the postdocs uh, who generate uh, those uh, preliminary results that are present uh, in here. Uh, specifically, it's Jing, Hongjun, Jialun, Junzhe, Kai, Ankit, and Ashwin. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Wenjuan and Cheng. Uh, I think uh, we should move on to the next uh, speakers. Uh, it's Ching again and Sagata. So that's the third talk.
Um, so who's, uh, will it be Ching? Uh, so got to kind of show that All right. <clears throat> All right. So sorry, everyone, you're stuck with me for a little bit longer. Uh, but now we're, uh, we're going to shift gears a little bit and talk about some of the, you know, I mentioned this at the beginning, some of the truly cross stack work that we're hoping to do as part of the ASAP uh, work here. Um, and, you know, we, we're looking at, you know, in particular processing in memory, uh, which I'm defining broadly as, you know, it could be processing with logic near uh, memory cells or tightly integrated with them, or it could be processing using memory, like some of the stuff we saw with Racer. Uh, I'm not closing the door to other types of non-von Neumann computing, but I figure this is a, it's a driving example that I think many of us are, you know, here are comfortable with in the center. Um, our goal here, though, is in reality to build, you know, what I'd like to consider end-to-end -end prototypes of these systems. Uh, so solving all of the issues from the top to the bottom of the stack with, you know, prototypes that we believe lend themselves to practicality for fabrication. Uh, and uh, Ching's actually going to talk a bit about one particular, you know, example of this that we have on how we're integrating uh, new types of devices for uh, robot and autonomous vehicle navigation. Uh, and then I'll come back and talk a little bit about some of the uh, you know, higher level integration challenges that we have. Uh, but real quick, just to motivate the types of applications we're looking at, uh, you know, I think a number of people these days when they hear in-memory computing, they think, Oh, well, that must be for uh, neural networks. Uh, but we've done a lot of work that's actually shown that going beyond neural networks, there is a home and, and really a strong need for, for uh, PIM. Uh, we did some work in conjunction with Google a few years ago looking at mobile workloads. I believe it was the first work looking at mobile devices and where PIM could actually benefit for that. Um, and you know, over the years, not only from our group, but uh, from a number of other groups, there have been, there's been work looking at how PIM can apply to a number of important and emerging application domains. Uh, the picture I've got here is one super high level view of a co-designed hardware software, uh, sorry, hardware software co-designed for an accelerator for genome sequencing with PIM. Um, and we find that there are just a number of these data intensive workloads and their domains where we have a lot of opportunities for PIM. But it's not just a matter of saying, hey, let's just look for the high bandwidth utilization and call it a day. Um, there are a number of software factors that come into play with how useful PIM can be. And there's actually a number of hardware factors that come into this as well. And that's strictly looking just from what I'd argue is a very architecture-centric view, doing some of the profiling and, and understanding a lot of the bottlenecks that we're dealing with. Uh, for a lot of the projects I mentioned on the last slide, if we really go beyond that and we want to truly design uh, efficient uh, accelerators for these types of domains. What we've found over the years that we really need to think about the entire stack. Um, and this is true even as you know, there are specialized PIM uh, products that are coming out to the market. Uh, you know, one of the things that we find is that if you want to go more general purpose, so if you want to go for other domains beyond the ones that are out there, there are still a number of key pieces that are missing from the stack. And as we're designing these systems from end to end, we really need to think about all of this, right? We need to think about the applications that we're using to drive these designs. And we need to think about how we take these new pieces of, of hardware and integrate them in with the rest of the system as we execute. Uh, and so with that as sort of a motivating example, I'm gonna throw over to Ching, who's going to discuss, you know, in particular, how we've done this integration from the devices level up to the architecture for, or how we're proposing to do this, I should say for uh, one particular use case. So Ching, whenever you're ready. Okay, um, right. So so I got to talk about the, 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 the general motivation, like why we want to do it, right? So we want to do the in-memory processing. Well, but the problem is if you want to do it in the efficient fashion, you also have pretty high requirement on the characteristics of the memory cell you're, you're working with, right? So ideally, like you want a kind of analog memory that has the capability to store multiple bits of information within a single device. And also you want to do processing with it within those memory cells. You want the uh, resistance change of these memory cells to be both linear and also symmetric with each other, right? But uh, in, the, in reality, right, if you just based on the, the, the standard type of non-volatile memory devices, okay, we're talking about both 
you know, metal oxide based MAM resistors as well as kind of phase change memories. What you actually got over here is on one hand, you got this highly asymmetric kind of programming characteristics of your memory device. And also to make things worse, you also have pretty large kind of cycle to cycle variation. So then the question we ask ourselves is, you know, what we can do from a material device level to get a better memory device, and then we integrate into a kind of better system for the uh, processing and memory applications. Um, so please go to the next slide. Right, so the device prototype we're working on is called the ECRAM or electrochemical random access memory. So different from PCM and uh, uh, RAMs. So here we actually have a three terminal device. And in this case, we have the tungsten oxide as the channel of our device. And we have the column oxide integrated on top as a kind of solid state electrolyte for protons. So in terms of the operation, in, in, when we perform the write to the memory cells, we apply a voltage pulse to the gate. So that's going to drive uh, the drift and diffusion of protons go from the condom oxide into the tungsten oxide. And that's going to change the resistivity of the channel. So the change of the resistance can then be read out by applying a much smaller bias across the source strain electrodes. So here with this three terminal device, by separating the read and write operation, we will be able to get a much better device operation symmetry, as well as a much smaller cycle to cycle variability. And another thing we, we pay particular attention over here is we intentionally choose all the materials that is actually compatible with conventional silicon-based CMOS technology, right? Both tungsten oxide, the condom oxide, and proton, they're pretty much compatible with silicon-based technology platform. Uh, so please go to the next slide. Right, so here is about the device characteristic, right? So here you can say we can modulate the different levels of conductance within the device channel. We have nearly perfect kind of symmetry and the linearity at the same time. If you compare that with uh, uh, other or, or kind of competing non-volatile memory technologies, uh, the, the linearity and the symmetry of this ECRAM is by far the best compared to uh, all the other uh, possible candidates. Uh, so if you go to the next slide. Um, so we can also operate the device with a, a reasonably fast speed. I mean, that's generally a limitation for EC RAMs. Uh, but here, because we use Proton as the intercalation species in this EC RAM, um, due to the small size of the protons, they have much faster diffusion coefficient compared to lithiums and, and oxygen ions. Right, so here we can operate the device pretty successfully over a very decent uh, dynamic range of ratio four using 300 microsecond pulses. You can also operate the device with 10, five or even micro, one microsecond pulses. Um, you're gonna get a little bit smaller device off ratio, but the excellent symmetry and the low noise operation are pretty much preserved. And because the device is pretty much based on CMOS compatible technology, so we can use conventional microfabrication techniques to fabricate the scaled ECRAM prototypes. The smallest device we fabricate has a footprint of only 150 by 150 nanometer size. Um, so the next slide. Uh, the device also have pretty good endurance, right? So we can operate the device over 100 million read write pulses uh, in ambient, and we don't see any sign of uh, device degradation. If you put a diffusion barrier, a proton diffusion barrier in the form of amorphous hafnium oxide on top, we can also successfully operate the device in high vacuum. So, the, so those ECRAM prototype has excellent environmental stability. Uh, the next slide. Now, because this is compatible with silicon, so we can actually integrate this ECRAM prototype directly with uh, conventional silicon-based uh, uh, fuel effect transistors. So we can form a uh, one transistor, one ECRAM type of memory cell um, with the silicon transistor as the selector, right? So we can avoid the problem like the, uh, you know, the leakage current problems or the right disturbance problem when, if we want to do the parallel update of the information recorded inside the ECRAM arrays. Um, so we further demonstrate a kind of four by four memory cell arrays uh, and uh, each pixel is composed of one silicon MOSFET plus one ECRAM memory cell. Um, so go to the next slide. In this case, we can successfully in, in, uh, perform the parallel update uh, 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 the weight update right, with, uh, uh, for, for each memory cell inside the arrays. 
And if you go to the next slide, it sh also shows like after we do the programming, we can also use it to accelerate the vector matrix multiplication. So what we're doing over here is just the, the simple color transformation where we first encode, uh, encode the, the, the transformation matrix into the ECRAM array. And then we apply the RGB channels as the input voltage and then the transport the, the, the transformed RGB value will be extracted as the current, and then we convert it back, right? So here you can say the calculation performed using the ECRAM array is comparable to what you get based on just the software. Um, so if you go to the next slide, uh, we also perform the simulation. So here we say, we want to say what's gonna be the capability of this ECRAM array to serve as a, a hard, hardware accelerator uh, for the training of deep neural networks, right? So this is a very simple example. It's a multi-level perceptron and to classify the amnest uh, database. Uh, and here we incorporate all the device non-idealities measuring experiments, right? So in addition, to their different degree of symmetry, linearity, kind of dynamic range, uh, the operating in voltage as well as the operating speed. We also extract the cycle to cycle variability, device to device variability, as well as the conductance variation all from the experiment. So here you can say, even with all this kind of device non-idealities, uh, for the accelerators based on EC RAM arrays, you will be able to achieve about two times lower energy consumption and more than 10 times smaller chip area cost uh, with comparable level of classification accuracy compared to what you can do if you build the accelerator using the conventional SRAM technology. So go to the next slide. Uh, well, for the next step, right, what we're trying to do is to push it closer to a technology with system level demonstration. So specifically, what we're trying to do is we want to uh, integrate this ECRAM arrays with uh, silicon CMOS circuits in the framework of Shannon inspired statistical computing. And specifically here, we're gonna apply the uh, algorithmic noise tolerance technique to solve the, uh, the, the low signal to noise ratio problem um, for us to uh, apply the uh, kind of new type of uh, non-conventional memory devices for a memory computing applications. Uh, and we believe it has the capability to dramatically reduce the error rate without incurring too large energy or area overhead of the chip. Uh, and in terms of the application, we're gonna use this chip to perform the continual learning in the simultaneous localization and mapping algorithms for kind of self-driving cars or autonomous robots, where we believe uh, for those uh, uh, mobile devices, right? So the energy efficiency is much more important compared to the computational speed. Um, so Sagata, that's, uh, that's all I have. Sure, thanks Ching. And one thing to note here, you know, this is a project that uh... Ching, Shalu, Narash, and I have actually been looking at uh, together. And you know, we believe that there are, you know, we've actually picked SLAM because not only is it a, an important driver for energy efficiency, but we actually believe that there are um, a number of key benefits that, that the EC RAM technology actually has to that work really well with the types of uh, emerging uh, uh, for, feed forward type of SLAM algorithms that have been proposed in the last year or two uh, in the uh, robotics world. Now, in the interest of catching us up back in time, so we have enough time for questions, I'm gonna to try to shortcut this a little bit and I'm happy to answer questions and talk more about it once we, uh, once we come back uh, with Q&A. But uh, one thing I wanna highlight is that, you know, we, we've talked so far about the integration from the devices up to the architecture and including, you know, looking at the algorithm itself. Um, a number of other things that we want to look at as part of our system integration are, how do we provide support for multiprocessing? It's something that we take for granted today in CPUs and, and even in GPUs now, but uh, we haven't really thought much about you know, PIM and how we can do multiprocessing for that. And so we really wanna look at how we can share these accelerators, how we can support virtual memory. We have some ideas on how to do each of these, uh, as, uh, each of these uh, tasks in a way that works for a lot of the applications we're looking at. Um, and we really want to look at programmability. Uh, and so, you know, we've done some work in the past looking at things like cache coherence, uh, some initial versions of virtual memory work that we've looked at. Um, but we do have a vision that we want to do as part of this work for the center where we actually design uh, compilers and uh, modify compilers in fairly straightforward ways to be able to uh, allow us to actually deal with the data mapping problems that people have been working with. 
we want to look at coming up with new uh, sort of revisiting familiar programming models and adapting them to PIM and providing domain specific libraries that can allow us to really exploit these devices. Uh, and so with that, you know, like I said, I'll, I'm happy to talk more about that during the Q&A if anybody has any questions, but uh, we'll close up there so we can leave time for you guys to ask us things. So thank you very much. Thank you. So I guess, uh, yeah, I want to thank all the speakers for delivering such wonderful talks, a uh, lot of thought provoking ideas. Uh, this is a time for us uh, to ask questions. I want to open the floor um, and ask our uh, guests uh, from industry if they would like to ask a question. Um, they can unmute themselves and ask a question. They can chat a question and the speakers will be glad to um, answer those. Um, if uh, just to set the ball <clears throat> rolling, uh, I can you know, begin the Q&A session. In fact, uh, as I was listening to these talks uh, you know, for Sogata and uh, Nam, in particular, um, you know, this idea of um, you know, scaling up uh, processor in memory architectures and sort of creating this uh, full stack view, I think that's a very challenging problem and I'm glad uh, you guys have some neat ideas on that front. Um, now, um, I, you know, one of the things we always struggle with is a idea such as PIM being so radical in one sense, they need to be, you know, benchmarked, right? Against uh, its nearest competitor. And today I would say the nearest competitor would be a systolic array digital, you know, standard digital accelerator, uh, systolic array type spatial architectures. Uh, and those architectures are in fact making rapid progress uh, year after year, writing Moore's law. Uh, and for workloads like neural networks and all, where there's a lot of data reuse going on, uh, these digital accelerators actually do pretty well because they, you know, they overcome the memory wall issue. Uh, they utilize you know, pretty advanced, sophisticated data flow uh, in their implementations. So if I pull in all of those advantages uh, and put them into the bucket of digital accelerators, and then I take PIM, all right, uh, architectures that you are proposing and draw, try to compare the two uh, in terms of let's say energy efficiency or you know, latency, uh, do you have some rough ideas as to what that gap might look like? Um, just as a reference, by the way, if you take a um, analog, in memory architecture today and scale it up, right? And look at the best scaled up analog in memory architecture, which is supposed to be the most energy efficient compute engine, you know, on a per bit uh, basis. The gap is actually about, you know, not that much, it's about two X uh, or less when you compare to an advanced digital accelerator. So I wonder where, you know, these PIM type architectures, where would they fall and if there is some you know, some uh, magic sauce in there that we can exploit that's not available to the analog in memory architectures. No, I, I think that's an excellent question, Arash. And Nam, so feel free to fill in anything that you know you want to beyond this. But um, I mean, I'll, I'll give you the short answer, at least for now. Uh, if you're only doing neural network inference and nothing else, I don't necessarily think we bring the winning proposition here, and that's intentional. Um, you know, we've actually done comparisons to uh, analog uh, uh, in you know, uh, uh, analog based neural network accelerators ourselves. And we've seen that we are roughly competitive, but we're, you know, we're losing probably another uh, 50 to 70% performance. So we're roughly within the same order of magnitude for the neural network computations now, which was not the case in our micro paper. We've actually figured out a number of advances. And we're actually, we're just talking uh, with some of my students today about ways in which you can push the envelope and sort of overcome some of those barriers. But that said, I think the way, the place that I see this is really as a, a true edge device. You know, we've talked a lot about the types of independence that we'd like to have for devices in the field. And one of the big places where we lose a lot of energy is simply on you know, uh, transmitting a lot of reasonably raw data across the network. And so that requires always on network connectivity and it requires burning a lot of modem power. Our hope is that you know, a device that sort of builds upon racer or racer-like technologies 
allows us to do a lot more than just neural network inference, yeah. right? We have we have the support for you know what I'd argue is a fairly fundamental set of of operation primitives, mm -hmm. and you can see that in some of the micro benchmarks that we're looking at. You know, we look at things like image recognition. Uh, we've been looking a little bit at things like speech recognition. We've looked at uh, data analytics. And we find that overall, those have significant wins over, you know, sort of the equivalent architectures that we that we could provide. And so our hope here is that, you know, if you uh, that we would be able to provide us like sort of a one chip solution that could provide you with all of that edge uh, capability and what, what I'd argue is a very energy efficient package. Yeah. I think that's really the goal that I have in mind. I think that's that's a good good answer. I think you are. Uh... Uh, objective is to actually address a broader class of workloads, exactly. and that that that's a different uh, ball game altogether. So yeah, thank you. Uh, actually, there are a couple of questions from the sponsors, and I don't know who put in first, but I see uh, Carlos raising his hand. Carlos, do you want to ask your question? Sure, um, Naresh, Thank you, and team. Thank you very much for the uh, presentations and the uh, tremendous insights and projections on on what you plan to do. I have basically three comments and three questions. Um, so the first comment, I, I really like you to, again, keep in mind uh, the power supply scalability. The ability to, for industry to scale power supply uh, is critical enough for power scaling, right? and we cannot ignore that. And, and of course, that is strictly tied down to the devices we deal with that, either to do the logic or to memory operations. So the common is, again, as you do select some of the memory elements uh, for the work that you plan to do, please do consider strongly how do they uh, scale and how, in particular, how will they scale in terms of power supply and, and their own energy efficiency? That's extremely important uh, consideration. Um, the second one, uh, the second comment had to do with, uh, with leakage, uh, uh, particularly as you embark in this analog uh, type of computing. Uh, some of the devices that you might choose for that uh, will be prone to significant amounts of leakage. So, you know, it's still how will that uh, leakage power uh, factor in uh, in the application opportunities for those novel concepts that you have becomes very critical. Um, there may be cases where maybe it's not an issue, but uh, when you consider the edge, uh, there will be significant issues. So I think keeping in mind the leakage as well as I said earlier, the power, particularly internal power supply, both remain very critical. And the third aspect is uh, I heard, uh, you know, the consideration for multi-level cells, right? Uh, obviously that's a very important knob for, for effective density, um, but uh, it is important also, again, as you, Look into different memory type, uh, different memory types, uh, or different elements that you uh, remain cognizant of the controllability uh, and the variability capabilities. Right for certain applications where you really do want to count on distinguishable states, uh, are we really, we really need to make sure we factor that metric in there. Do we have the no enough uh, bit or race to support it and are they attainable uh, by the technology, right? Um, we, we don't want to, you know, eventually say, oh yeah, this will work wonderful. We can assume we can have four bits on a cell or, or, or a bits, whatever it is. But when you go to, to, to look at it, what the requirements is, oh, I, I need, you know, pretty much a 10 sigma control on a given state or something like that, something that might not be practical to do. So on MLC aspects, please do keep uh, at a higher level of visibility, the requirements on, on a state controllability and variability. Right? That's, that's very important, okay? So very quickly, I'll, I'll just enunciate the three questions I have. Uh, 
hopefully it won't take too long to answer them, but then, um, and then that, that will be all. The first one, um, the first question is on, on razor. Um, and it's a question of how much uh, the benefits in energy efficiency and performance of razor are projected to scale with problem size, right? Um, is the overhead of the other logic and, uh, and the processing to manage that uh, uh, increasing with problem size or, or, or actually get, get the overhead becomes less and less? And I, I, I quite did not get that from the presentation. Um, the second one um, uh, is related to the um, reconfigurable logic. I, 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 if I understand correctly, the idea is to use, you know, these sort of electric transistors that, that can be uh, changed in polarity from N to P or P to N. My question is, are we really, into, how is that structured to do that? Because if we are truly taking, talking about uh, changing the polarity of um, of the device, meaning we still remain uh, remain in hands mode. Then you also need to be able to change the the contacts. I mean, the drain and the source. How would that be? Or are we really talking about changing the operation from enhanced mode to um, you know uh, uh, you know just getting the channel uh, on all the time? And if the latter, then you, you basically have, again, the question of leakage and that need to be addressed. So I just wonder how, how, how is that uh, logic uh, concept uh, at the device level being uh, considered? And, and the third one is on easy RAM. Uh, easy RAM, yes, uh, there's several work already that, uh, you know, for the linearity benefits and very, very, Solid, but then the question again, even though as, as, uh, as it was presented today, you already made some uh, significant inroads in, this, in the area scalability. If I heard correctly, somewhere around 150, 200 nanometer or so. One of the challenges of easy RAM, in, in our opinion, is what is the density? Can it really scale to, to you know? to levels that are competitive enough. And if so, uh, it would be good to address that or state how you plan to get there. Yeah, so those are my comments. I'm sorry it took a lot of time, but uh, hopefully it'll help. Thank you, Maresh. Sure, no, no, very good points you raised. I think we have made a note of all of those, um, power supply, leakage, MLC issues, and I think uh, there are good answers to all of them. But I think we want to get to the questions you asked uh, and have the speakers address those. So maybe the racer question, uh, Sogata, do you want to take that? Sure, um, and, and yeah, Carlos, you raised very good points. And actually some of that you know, stuff about uh, power and you know the the issue of resolving more than one bit of window inside a cell is actually you know are there's some of the key motivations behind why we designed racer and we actually tried to stay very strictly within uh sort of practical bounds that way it's part of the reason that we did things in the digital domain um in terms of the scalability um i'll throw out two things there the first is that uh you know we in Racer, we didn't do the normal architect thing, which is simply just, ah, oh, let's put it in the simulator and hope it all works. Uh, we actually worked carefully with you know, circuits uh, researchers to, to uh, have spice models and transistor level models of the entire uh, control flow and peripheral circuitry. Um, that's one of the big things that we wanted to make sure we had. And you know, we looked at how that load scaled as we increased the size of a chip Know, things like you know, parasitics and, and the, the load capacitance that we're dealing with with simply just the distance of the wires. Um, and we looked at you know, increasing problem sizes as we scale the size of our chip. Um, and for the most part, part of the reason we try to keep everything to a cluster level is that it does allow for reasonably close to linear scaling in the power usage that we have. Um, and so while it's really not perfect uh, because there is some interconnection that we allow to have uh, circuit, uh, different clusters communicate with each other, it's, it's more linear than we've seen in prior solutions. And that was kind of one of our goals. Um, addressing the second thing, uh, and this is the thing I always like to say when I present the numbers and I didn't do it just in the sake of time. Um, you know, 100x, 100x numbers are, obviously they sound shocking sometimes. Um, and I think it's important to note that 
as we look at the systems considerations, including you know compilers, runtimes, all those kinds of things, we fully expect that we will lose performance that way because those naturally have some sort of suboptimalities associated with them. Uh, our hope is that given how healthy the margins are right now, uh, that we still have a good amount of room to be able to grow in there so that even when we take those overheads into account with real systems as part of our end-to-end -end work, that uh, we'll still be able to show significant savings uh, you know, across the board. But a lot of that, as you can imagine, would depend on the exact overheads that we're looking at. Okay, thank you. Um, there was a question about the scalability of ECRAM area scalability. I don't know, Ching, if you want to quickly answer that one. Uh, yeah, sure, sure. Um, so yeah, in our current experiment, we demonstrate like we can do it 150 nanometer by 150 nanometer size. Um, so we compare that with kind of three micron by three micron size. We don't see any difference in terms of the device performance. So that's basically gave us the confidence to show the ECRAM uh, has pretty good scalability. Well, the question is, you know, whether we can make it be kind of 10 nanometer by 10 nanometer, it is possible. I don't see any problem from a material perspective because when we uh, do the intercalation reaction, right, the amount of proton we introduce into the tungsten oxide lattice is still pretty limited, kind of less than 1%. And that's where be sufficient to induce the, the, the large enough change of the electrical properties of our device. So that's one aspect of the question. Another aspect of the question is, well, no matter what we do, right, so the easy RAM compared to the PC, PC RAM and, and RAM, um, we have a three terminal device, right? So we, we definitely gonna occupy a little bit larger device area. But on the other hand, another important benefit for the EC RAM is uh, we have pretty small kind of cycle to cycle variability, right? If you look at our switching characteristic, it has very small noise. So just as you mentioned, right? So we talk about this MLC, the multi-level cells, the, the controllability and reliability is, is important. So another benefit for this three terminal devices is we indeed, right? Have the capability to store more information, right, within a single memory cell. So that's gonna be helpful for us to consider the overall picture of scalability. And the last aspect of the scalability is about the device resistance, right? That's also critically important if you want to scale up the size of uh, uh, the, the, the crossbar arrays we're talking about. And that's another kind of benefit for, for the ECRAM, right? We actually have the capability to modulate uh, the device operating resistance range or conductance range all the way from kind of nano semen to micro semen regime. So in that aspect, um, um, the ECRAM has better kind of this array scale uh, scalability compared to to PC RAMs and and, and R RAMs. Yeah. Right. Thank you. Yeah. That would be good. Yeah, actually, I because... have one comment uh, about uh, Carlos. Question. So you you are concerned about the controllability of these multi-level cells, and uh, I think that's why it's important to combine that with the uh, approximate computing, where you don't need that precise uh, state control there. Does it make sense to you? Also, you know, there are uh, air control coding solutions, right? Uh, there will be an overhead, uh, and one can use ECC methods to protect against, um, you know, this overlap in the distribution of different levels. Uh, but all of that is very interesting to study. Um, yeah, but... I, I think there's, 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 there's exactly the point, I, you know, uh, as you approach this, it's a holistic solution, right? And then finding, uh, you know, what's the optimum trade-off, right? Exactly. Without overwhelming, uh, some aspects of the technology, that, that's the key thing. Yes, yeah, thank you. Yeah, okay. yeah. it has to be a joint uh, system yeah. and device research. You don't want to put all the burden on one side or the other. So yeah. Uh, yeah. thank you. Uh, actually, Ben, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. go ahead. Ben, uh, the ferro yeah, the, the ferroelectric question on the ferroelectric devices and the change of polarity, how, how do you really plan to do that in the device structure? Because... Really, if you're trying to change to say that, okay, we have enhancement type transistors and we are going to change it from N type to P type or P type to N type, then you are not only talking about the, the gate uh, or the channel control or the channel change, but then you also have to be able to change the, the drain and the source. 
or are you really talking about is changing, you know, between enhancement mode and depletion mode? And that part of the, you know, of, of the comment on the reprogrammable logic of electric, uh, to me, was still uh, not clear, but maybe somewhere offline, we can, we can take care of that question. Yeah. Well, I, I can address that question. Um, so here we use uh, short key barrier transistors. Uh, so uh, there is no uh, substitution or doping in the source strain region. So by induce electron and hole doping in the source strain by using polarization, then we can change uh, the doping type in the source strain region. So you can change from N type to P type. The doping in the channel will be uh, either not tuned or tuned separately by uh, the additional program gate. So um, if we only change the polarity uh, for the source strain region, then the transistor will remain at the enhancement mode for both N-type and P-type transistor. So it's a unipolar transistor in this case. Um, oh. if, if, okay, got it, yeah. Yeah, okay, thank you. Thank you, yeah. So yeah, that was a very nice uh, set of discussions. I want to get to Tio's question. There was a question that Tio asked earlier. Um, so this is for Wen Juan. What is the linearity of your analog memory? And by what means you measure linearity? Tio is here, so. Wen Juan, you want to answer that question? Okay, so. Uh... This is uh, for photo electric tunnel junction or graphene uh, analog comparator. Uh, the later, the second one. Uh, the graphene. Okay, so for graphene transistor, uh, so um, since it's a zero band gap and the electron hole has uh, the similar uh, mobilities. So in principle, the transfer curve is a V shape. Uh, so the output uh, current will be proportional to the absolute difference between the input voltage. Uh, so you have a, a, a linear uh, transfer curve uh, for the ideal graphene transistor. In a realistic graphene transistor, the curve will not be a perfect uh, V-shape. So because you have a residual dopings in the substrate, so the bottom of the V-shape will be rounded up the, instead of a perfect V shape, it will be more like uh, um, uh, between a U and a V shape. So you have a small plateau at the bottom. Uh, in that case, that uh, if the input voltage is far away from the direct voltage, the, cur the, the current is linearly proportional to the input voltage. But if it's too close to the direct voltage, then there is a small a rounded region that it will be deviated from the linear uh, transfer curve. So, so what what kind of dynamic range is there? I mean, normally you you could achieve, right? But, but the dynamic range might be might be an issue as well, you know, given you know how much what is the range for linearity that you can achieve? And in analog, it's it's very important. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah, so for this uh, particular applications, uh, the main uh, purpose of the graphene comparator is calculate the absolute difference between them. Um, so the I think the linearity itself is probably not very important uh, in this application. Do, do you ever consider this application for for neural network? No, uh, we use this uh, to uh, mainly for uh, the image comparison or the signal uh, comparison. So if the input voltage or uh, input image are very different from the target image, then the output current uh, will be dramatically larger than the minimum uh, current. So by monitor the output current, then we can uh, we can have a direct readout at the input voltage and the target uh, voltage or an input image versus a target image. So this is not for a neuromorphic computing or uh, for the synapses uh, applications. Okay. 
uh, it's a different application. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Uh, any other questions from the audience? Um, I know Vivek always has questions, so. Yeah, I was just talking to Vivek separately and uh, trying to convince him to come see us uh, in April. So if he's not coming, I have to put him on the spot and make him ask a question right now. <laughs> Okay, if you, if you insist. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we do. Thank you. I actually, Carlos asked many of the questions I had in mind, especially the N2P and P2N uh, for the Federal devices. I think I was wondering about that too. So actually, many of the questions were answered. So I don't know if I have any new mm -hmm. burning question that I have at this point. But yeah. I'll, you know, I'll send some by chat or email if I if sure, I can. Sure. Actually, this idea of switching, you know, making N and P polarity programmable without going in all in the enhancement mode makes me think that uh, maybe a better use of that might be for you know pass transistor logic uh, it might be make more sense there because your input is always you know switching and uh, you want to pass a strong one or a strong zero right and typically we want to use either a pmos or an nmos if we knew what the input polarity was so here, if you can actually switch, then it may be you know, possible to use just one transistor and have the benefit of getting a very strong uh, you know, one or zero pass through it. So pass transistor logic might be one, one uh, topology that would be particularly suited for, uh, for this uh, transistor that Wen Juan has been exploring. But anyway, now those are good, good thoughts, good questions. Um, I have one last question. I know we're kind of like 25 minutes already above the time limit, but uh, Benjuan, have you thought about uh, putting these ferroelectric materials as the gate dielectric for wide band gap materials? Yes, uh, that's actually the one we're working on uh, for the DAPA project uh, for sodium nitride and silicon carbide transistors. Uh, do you get any memory window in those transistors when you put the ferroelectric gate dielectric at all? Uh, it depends on what is the device structure. Um, typically, it's harder for wide band gap materials to uh, switch the memory window because it's hard to induce the other type of the carriers that exactly. need larger yeah. voltage. Uh, however, it is uh, possible as long as you have a, a good contact to the substrate uh, or the channel that you can have a source to provide the addition, the other type of the carriers. Um, I see, because I was, re yeah, I'll, I'll talk to you later about that because that is quite interesting to me to be able to build some of these, um, you know, on the wide band gap materials because then you could really use them at extremely high temperatures if possible. So that would be uh, quite uh, interesting as well to, to think about, but thank you. Thank you. All right. So I think this was a wonderful session. I want to thank all the speakers, also the industry uh, members who asked questions and attended. If you have any additional questions, please feel free to uh, send it to any of us. We'd be glad to answer those. And uh, we hope to see uh, most of you, if not all of you, at uh, the April in-person meeting. Yes, yes, please register for our April in-person meeting. So I really, really urge you, we're going to be sending out personal um, email notes signed by myself and Ching. And we have a nice hotel block, a very nice two-day program. So please uh, try to visit us here. Thank you. All right, so do we conclude it now, Shalu? Yes, yes, I've said everything I needed to, All yes, right. thank you. So thanks, and uh, we'll be in touch. Bye-bye. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye.